you can take it away. Great. Yeah, thank you. Good. Did you hear me? Uh, Rachel, do you want to drive or do you want me to drive? Hi, Phone. Um, I was thinking maybe we could swap back and forth with sharing or either way. Um, is that? Uh, is that I'll tell you what. How about, well, yeah, let's, um, you know what, how about, do you want to just drive then? Because I'm afraid if we do too many swap backs and forth, we'll. It'll be hard. Okay. Yeah. We'll yep. I can share my trouble. screen. Okay. Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Is that something you can adjust? Let us share our screen. It should be, should be co host. Uh, Adam Rachel or... hasn't been made a co host yet. Pardon me? You made Karina one, but not, not Rachel. Oh, okay. So we need to make Rachel co host also, huh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Please. Oh. Oh, yep, there it is. Okay. All right. Let's see. Can you see that okay? You can. Yeah, looks great. Cool. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and kick us off. Uh, yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting us today and um, for everybody joining on this uh, beautiful Tuesday of ours. Uh, so we are going to be kind of focusing today's conversation on on our new um, living building headquarters here in downtown Portland. Um, and I would recommend if anyone hasn't had a chance to come and see it in person, um, I we we do tours regularly and we love taking people through the space. We'll we'll do our very best to paint a beautiful picture for you today of what is all happening in this building, but there's nothing like seeing in it, uh, seeing it with your own eyes. So um, yeah, so it open offer um, to anybody uh, if you feel like coming down and, and checking it out in person we would love to take you through um, the space but we're gonna be framing the conversation today around this building and hopefully answer some of the questions that Bob put forth around net zero and how do we decarbonize the built environment uh, so with that let's see so um, we're gonna talk about it within the context of the living building challenge um, which is the most kind of aspirationally focused of the, living, the uh, green building certifications. And we'll kind of frame it within that because we do feel that uh, the living building is, is outlines the, one of the paths um, that might get us to um, building decarbonization. And that is obviously the, the kind of what we used as our guiding framework for this project. Um, and so then within that, um, we have discussions around um, embodied um, emissions or carbon, um, seismic considerations around that, and we'll get into the energy, the microgrids, really kind of do a deep dive on what we did with those systems and, and how we moved towards um, not being not even only net zero, but in fact, net positive energy. Um, and then we also want to talk about net positive water, because we really do feel that a truly kind of holistically sustainable project isn't just about the energy and the materials, but also um involves closing the um, water and nutrient cycles too all right so we'll do some quick introduction so i'm karina hirschberg i'm a senior associate at pae i'm a kid out of our portland office i'm sitting right now in our living building as i speak to you um, so i'm an electrical engineer is my background i was many years on the design side um, but i have shifted over and i now am one of our regional um, leaders for what we call our regenerative design group which is our research analysis and modeling uh, team here and then i also lead our renewable energy systems group and so that's the microgrids and on-site renewables and batteries and and kind of all that great uh, future of energy uh, kind of work and I'm joined uh, by my my colleague Rachel as well and Rachel I'll let you introduce yourself all right yeah my name is Rachel Rublick I'm a mechanical engineer at PAE um, been with PAE for about eight years uh, I got into this field interested in passive solar design, studied uh, renewable energy and biology, um, and then somehow made my way over to the mechanical engineering side, um, where I focused on sustainability um, and uh, re really trying to put that holistic lens on it.
Okay, so I'm just going to quickly introduce PAE for those who aren't familiar with us. Um, so we are an energy, con or excuse me, an engineering consulting firm. Um, we have offices kind of up and down the West Coast is sort of predominantly where we do most of our work, but we also, we've done projects around the country, particularly um, when they're very innovative, high performance ones. Um, and we say that our, our mission, our vision is to help solve the planet's energy and water challenges. And that what we'll be talking about today um, was very much uh, a guided by um, trying to help achieve that, that vision for um, our industry. Um, so our, our specialty is in the, the very kind of innovative, deeply sustainable, deep green projects. Um, and again, we've done them um, across the country. And I do mention that just because I think sometimes um, one of the, the excuses that is put forth on, on not being able to do really high performance buildings is, oh, we have this, you know, our, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too, too wet, it's too dry, it's too humid. Um, and we've achieved living buildings in essentially every every climate zone, including extreme climate zones across the country. We did a living building, um, the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is about 7,000 feet up in the Rocky Mountains. It's very cold, very dry. Um, and we were able to achieve net zero energy on that project. Um, the Candida building, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, on the Georgia Tech campus, so very hot, very humid. That one is also certified living building. And then, of course, um, the PAE Living Building. We also did Bullet Center up in Seattle, if anyone's familiar with that. So um, our, our uh, voice to the industry is that we can absolutely do this. Um, and it's really just a matter of, of trying to figure out how do we do, how do, we do more of them, um, but they can be done um, really anywhere that we all work. Okay, so just to kind of help frame the conversation, I wanted to do a, a quick introduction on what the Living Building Challenge is. Um, for anyone who is maybe if this is a new certification program. So the Living Building Challenge is essentially putting forth the idea that um, buildings, if you think of buildings, start thinking of buildings as almost like natural systems, right? And you, the, the analogy that they use is a, is a flower, it's the petals that you have to achieve on it. But I think, you know, a tree would also be a good analogy for it as well. But it's essentially this idea of can we start um, thinking about buildings in terms of their sense of place and how they are interacting in a part of the natural cycles and systems around them. Um, next slide, maybe. And really what this is trying to push us towards is that, you know, historically sustainability um, hasn't necessarily pushed far enough, right? We kind of had to stop the bleeding before we could even start getting into the healing phase. And so, um, you know, sustainability has, has often been in terms of how do we be less bad? Um, but if we really are gonna get to this sort of restorative state that we need to, to address the climate crisis, right? We need to move from being just being less bad into actually being this force of good. And so the living building challenge is what it's really trying to push us kind of over that inflection point um, and moving us into this truly kind of restorative state. And this, this idea that buildings, again, cannot, instead of just being a less bad part of the problem that we actually can be part of the solution um, to some larger systemic issues. Um, so it's framed within um, this kind of framework of petals. And so it's the seven petals, place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, equity, and beauty. And so to be a fully certified living building, you need to achieve all the requirements of all of the petals. It is not an insignificant undertaking. That's why there unfortunately are so few buildings out in the world um, that are fully certified, but we certainly would love to see um, more of them. And um, you can kind of, Rachel, next slide maybe. Um, one thing I will mention on this project is, again, one of the um, perceived limitations of widespread adoption of living buildings is that they are more expensive. Um, and in the case of our building, we're, we're not going to talk about it too much in terms of the economic side, but I do just want to mention that this was a developer-led project, which means that from a financial standpoint, standpoint, we had to make the economics work just the way a typical building would have to make the economics work. And so, um, you know, we had to get investors and bank loans and all that sort of stuff. And so it wasn't funded through um, 
any sort of private fund. We, we had to play the same game that everybody else in the industry has to play. Um, and that was one of the things that we feel was one of the biggest accomplishments of this project is that it not only was environmental sustainability, but proved that you can do environmental sustainability in a way that is also economically um, sustainable, which, which we really hope and, and feel will open up the door to more of these projects. Um, so, um, like I said, we got all those pedals, there's all these different things, there's a lot of stories to tell um, on this project. We uh, could be here for hours if we told all the stories, but we know that everybody has to get back to their lives at some point. So um, today we're going to be focusing on the energy, water, materials, and nutrients with a little touch on seismic um, elements of it, a little bit touch on equity. Um, but again, I, I highly encourage anyone who feels like coming down and seeing the building, um, we'd love to talk you through and, and show you, share more of our stories and show you the spaces as, as well. But we'll get through as much as we can today. With that, I'll hand it over to uh, Rachel to talk us through the embodied emissions and the seismic aspects. Yeah. Could, uh, one thing I was just going to interject here is could uh, we get a group tour perhaps someday uh, of a larger group, not just one or two, but maybe absolutely 15, 20 I people. Can... I'll be your okay, tour guide. So <laughs> if you do 20 people, we'll want to have two. Of one of, you'll need, we'll need to have two groups because some of the rooms are kind of small, but we can, we can absolutely, um, uh, Katrina, who I think actually you were coordinating with, she um, manages all of our tours. So um, I would reach out to her and just let us know how many people you're thinking and, and yeah, we can absolutely accommodate okay. um, whatever Super. you got. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Karina. So um, let's dive into the building structure, seismic rating, and embodied carbon emissions. So uh, early in concepts, we were able to do an SD analysis of three possible structures, a steel, a concrete, and wood structure. Uh, we worked with KPFF, the structural engineer, and Walsh, the contractor on board, to get material estimates for the three different structure types, and then did a life cycle assessment to look at what this means for the embodied emissions of the structure. So um, this graph here um, on the right, you can see the three different structures, and then the two columns, the one in blue, is looking at a cradle to uh, to construction perspective that basically looks at the embodied emissions associated with material extraction, um, manufacturing, and then getting it, it to site and built. Uh, the, the green column looks at that full life cycle analysis and tries to incorporate uh, the end of life considerations, um, uh, uh, including um, for some metals recycling. And then um, in the case of wood, that's where we took account um, the fact that wood itself is biogenic in nature. And when uh, harvested from sustainable sources, um, uh, you can actually take credit for it for the, the carbon itself of, of the wood. So you can see the wood beat out uh, the other structures. Um, in both cases, uh, it was from a cradle to gate perspective, wood was 30% better than steel. And then from a full life cycle, it was 50% uh, better. So ultimately, that's what we went with, um, a wood structure building, which you can see in construction on the left. Um, there it, we used a CLT deck supported by timber columns and glue lambs. Um, this is braced on a, a concrete core. And then there's a topping slab on each floor. Um, very excited about the wood structure. It uh, brings, allows uh, for no ceilings um, and expose the wood, really bring the biophilic elements of that. Um, and then uh, we were using FSC certified wood. Um, harvested um, in North America, it actually came from Canada. We had a, a, a quite a time trying to find FSC certified wood that, that, was, that wasn't um, way off in, in Europe. Uh, so, oops, sorry about that. Um, what's going on here? Okay, there you go. So this is a time lapse of the building under construction. You could see that concrete core um, going up and then the wood structure around it. Um, and then here's the, the brick facade, all the windows going up. Um, so this is a, a look at the south facade of the building. 
And just, this is a diagram of a typical floor plate. So you can see that concrete core in the middle and then the structural framing uh, going east to west. And then those blue lines, uh, north, south, are um, chases within the CLT deck, which we were using for um, routing a lot of the utilities. To show you that here. So this is a view looking north and you can see those those utility chases um, up there. And so that actually allowed us to to route a lot of the small things um, up above the, the glue lamp beams. Not the ductwork. You can see some of the ductwork on the left there. That really just predominantly wraps around the core. Um, it stays in internal. Um, and uh, the the mechanical system. It's a it's a DOAS, so it's a dedicated outside air system um, providing ventilation air. And then the heating and cooling is a, a radiant system. All right, so then this is the finished look. This is actually looking east, and you can see those those chases once again. Um, they're uh, covered up. And another interesting thing to note here is those east-west beams. You can see the one um, on the left, but then on the right at the facade, um, there's not another beam up there. Um, we actually did an upturned beam um, at the floor. So the idea with that is to keep the window datum the same and up high all the way around. That really allows for us to maximize daylighting by having those high windows. Uh, so, uh, and one thing that we decided to do was upgrade to a category four seismic structure. And uh, we, we did this uh, for resiliency. We wanted the building to still be able to operate after a, um, a seismic event. Uh, an added benefit that came from this is that uh, because the building is designed to be less flexible with that category four, we were able to get four inches closer to our neighboring building, which is Pine Street Market. Um, and with that, an additional um, amount of leasable square footage. I think it's about 350 square foot additional. And the way the pro forma worked is that additional lease space um, paid for the upgrade in the seismic, uh, which, is, which was great. Okay, so then uh, this is a look at the embodied emissions of all the materials um, finished building. You can see that concrete and steel still rank up there pretty high there. It is not without concrete. I mentioned the, the shear core. There's also the foundations, the topping slab um, and a cistern um, underground. Um, another thing to point out here is the PV is fairly high. We followed ILFI guidelines on the embodied emissions associated with the PV. Um, you know, it's it's a, a energy intensive process. Um, looking a little bit deeper at the PV, uh, this graph here shows the upfront. It's basically looking at the net carbon emissions associated with the PV. So it, at year zero, there's all the embodied emissions associated with the manufacturing installation of that PV array. And then over time, the, the PV array offsets operational, uh, off, offsets emissions that would um, be associated with getting your electricity from the grid. And since we're operating at a net positive, um, then it, it starts to offset its own embodied emissions, pays back, goes negative by about year four. Um, which is pretty good um, uh, return, uh, though still more needs to happen with PV. Uh, right now, there is not a very robust recycling process um, in place. There's some recyclers out there that can handle the framing and the glass, but most of um, the um, uh, wafers themselves are uh, incinerated. So then there's some supply chain issues as well with that. Um, so something that our industry needs to work on. Okay, so then trying to wrap that all up, we looked at what are the embodied emissions. So all those emissions associated with the materials themselves, that's kind of a day one, once you op start operating the building, there's all these associated embodied emissions. And then the operational emissions associated with over a 30 year life cycle, and then also the refrigerants in the building. And um, this is just a comparison of a, like a typical code building and what its embodied emissions would be, or uh, total emissions would be versus the PA living building um, before we account for PV 
or any offsets. So just gains made in using a wood structure and um, being a very efficient building. And then the column at the right, we're actually going carbon negative. This is achieved by having that PV array um, operating at net positive energy, and then also um, purchasing a one-time offset for all the embodied emissions. All right. And with that, I'll turn it over to Karina to talk about energy and microgrids. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna take us through um, the electrical systems. Um, we'll talk about energy use in the building um, and then some of the more innovative elements that we, we have in the project, which as you see here is a very large on-site battery array um, that is part of a, a full uh, microgrid that we have um, for the building with a very unique um, utility interconnect. Um, so I'll start just to kind of ground us in, in the technical elements of it, of just what is a microgrid. It's, it's kind of turned into a little bit of a buzzword in the industry. And so I just want to, for this conversation today, make sure that we're all kind of working off of the same definition for it. Um, so the U.S. Department of Energy's um, microgrid exchange group, this is about maybe about five or six years ago, um, set out a definition um, that we see here, which essentially says it's a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources. So you have your loads, your generation sources, which could be PV or, you know, diesel generators. It doesn't actually specify that it's renewable, but for our, for our project, obviously um, we went with zero carbon um, system. So storage, generation sources, and then loads, right? Everything that it's serving. And so that that contained package is your microgrid. And then the part that makes it really tricky is this last part that says that it can connect and disconnect from the grid so that it can operate both in grid connected and islanded mode. And that's the really key piece to understand on that because we do see um, there's often a lot of misunderstanding around PV systems in particular. Um, most you know, residential PV systems, you have PV on your roof, you're connected to the grid. And folks are surprised that when the grid goes down, their PV does also goes down as well. Um, and there's 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 code reasons and there's safety reasons around that. But typically, if a PV system is not connected to a battery system as well, um, then it did it does go dark once the grid goes down. And so that is not a microgrid. For it to be a microgrid, it has to be partnered with something else. Storage batteries being typically the main one. Um, that's what becomes. Um, a microgrid. Um, and at the same time, uh, if you have a you know building that has a, an emergency generator um, and it only operates during emergency situations, again, when the grid is down, that's also not a microgrid. So for this conversation today and for our building, the system we have operates when the grid's going and also operates when the grid is down. Um, so microgrids, the reason it's such a buzzword is because it really is sort of the future of where our energy systems are are going um, and what make them such a, a there's many different reasons actually why they're such a powerful kind of movement um, part of it is it kind of moves from the centralized to the distributed so more localized um, partnering with the more um, kind of regional ones which from a resiliency standpoint is starting to become more important right there's the 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 grid in the United States is a pretty amazing entity but as we're starting to see with the climate changing and and um, wildfires and wildfire mitigation plans and then you know if we had major seismic event here um, in the northwest um, the grid, might not always be there or as reliable as we have um, come to trust it to be. And so microgrids are one of the ways that we can at least harden a little bit more at the local level by providing some additional resiliency, not necessarily to replace um, our larger grids, but more to add kind of a belt and suspenders um, system that allows um, at the local level, continued operation when the grids go down. On the other side, we have sustainability. And this, you know, comes from, um, you know, the integration of more renewables and more on-site renewables and on-site storage. But as we'll talk about in a little bit later here, um, there's another element um, to this that maybe, um, is, is honestly part of the one of the things that I'm most um, interested in where a lot of my work is, um, but isn't necessarily as uh, has as much visibility in the industry is that microgrids also allow buildings to be a little bit more grid interactive and operate a little bit more dynamically, which when you look at the path to decarbonization of the grids, um, one of the things they need is buildings that are um, that are more flexible than they have been in the past. And so, you know, 
Bob, to your point on how do we decarbonize, you know, buildings, I would say that there's even a a, a bigger story around it of how can buildings help decarbonize other systems, including um, looking towards um, the grids and some of our larger energy systems. Um, so when we kind of say, okay, that sounds lovely, what do we need for all this? Um, so we have our PV, our battery, and our loads, um, and all of that is knitted together in a microgrid control system. And I cannot emphasize enough how important that is. It's really, it's a lot of focus goes onto the hardware of these systems, but in many ways, it's a software problem to be solved. Um, and the control systems are, are complex, and it's an area that I would say we're going to see a lot of changes in in coming years as, as more and more um, groups start to figure out how these systems have to work. Um, it did, does make commissioning the building uh, a bit of an interesting journey as Rachel can attest to. She was one of our commissioning agents on it. Um, but it does ultimately, again, give us this much more um, dynamically operable building um, because it really we really are kind of moving into this world of, of smart buildings and microgrids are one of the key elements um, that makes that possible. Okay, so on the resiliency side, um, one of the things that microgrids and particularly storage um, does for us is that it helps us really understand how amazing the larger grids are. Our kind of modern lifestyle and, and modern built environment does really rely on the grids to be this, uh, what almost feels like an infinite source of energy. And that is kind of how the modern life cycle is, is structured. And so when we do look at off-grid, what it would take to be off-grid operation, um, part of that conversation often includes discussions about what are critical loads and what are loads that we maybe don't need to have operating. So in the case of our building, if um, if, if it was a day, maybe not like today, but maybe I think Thursday is supposed to be a little bit cooler. If it's a beautiful, you know, summer uh, day in Portland with, you know, nice temperatures, lots of daylight, lots of sunshine, um, we could potentially operate, you know, large areas of the building. I think when we ran the calculations for 100 days or more, um, if it was is the middle of December and it's rainy and it's really cold, we're probably looking at a shorter timeline in maybe a couple of weeks um, with less loads. But in any case, we have a path towards operating a building for a long duration, right, in, a major, in the event of a major outage, um, either at a high level of operation or at a minimum a critical loads, um, you know, kind of level of operation um, for for an extended, quite an extended period of, of time. Um, and we do feel that this is in terms of, you know, we're kind of talking about sustainability, but we do feel that resiliency is part of the sustainability story um, and what buildings need to be thinking about as we start to move into, um, you know, somewhat more uncertain uncertain times and, and climates that are, that are starting to change. All right, so um, this is this is kind of a lot on this slide here, but I wanted to talk through this again. This gets into that that point that I mentioned around how can buildings and the energy systems in buildings help with decarbonization, not only of the built environment, but help with decarbonization of the larger grid. So this is a just an example project um, that was a, a building in, in California. And in California, if, if you're familiar, it's kind of the very famous duck curve, right, which is the idea that they have um, been very successful in um, the deployment of solar, and they have a fairly or have historically had a fairly mild climate, although they're certainly getting heat waves these days, but uh, fairly mild climate. And so you could end up with conditions on a you know nice spring day, for example, where very low loads in the middle of the day and lots of solar production, sort of this kind of imbalance in, in how their loads and their productions are lining up. And so then what happens is, is, you know, end of the day comes, everybody goes home, they start making dinner and they turn on all their appliances. And so loads go up right at the time that the sun is starting to set. And so your PV is starting to come offline. And so you have this sort of ironic condition where you have this great deployment of renewables, but you could still have high emissions times of your day because of that mismatch between generation and, and needs. And so one of the things that we're starting to look at is how do we address that that sort of those sort of unique conditions on the shoulders of, of the day. And one of the ways that we can do that is by using um, batteries and you can do it through microgrids or you can do it through just a grid connected system. But essentially you take some of that excess generation that you have in the day, store it yourself and then discharge your battery in your evening so that the grid is not having to support your project. And it's a way to shift when the grid is seeing your loads and that then 
change is what the grid themselves need to provide and what kind of generation resources they're seeing. And so it's this interesting condition where, you know, historically we've talked about net zero energy means that the math works out on an annual basis. You use as much as you generate, right? But in many ways, it's just a, it's an exercise in mathematics. It's not really the real world condition. What this does for us is that it's starting to pull us into actually trying to align electrons with electrons. And what we see when we do that is that we can have an increased reduction, kind of proportional reduction in the operating emissions, the emissions associated with the energy use of the building as compared to the energy that it's actually using. Um, not for this particular case study, but another one we did um, looking at a, in, in Portland specifically, what we found was that with some very minor adjustments in how the building was operated and when the building was operating is that a energy use reduction of only, I think it was only about a 2% energy use, use reduction brought closer to a 5% reduction in the emissions of that energy simply by um, thinking a little bit differently about when we used it. And so this is, I would say this as we kind of look towards the future of um, how do we decarbonize the built environment. This is, I think, one of the most intriguing um, areas of, of potential for that. And where this leads us is, um, you know, into this idea of how do we how do we start scaling this up and and again Bob I like your perpetual motion that decarbonized buildings the same thing as perpetual it's a nice idea but physically impossible um, you know I think this 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 idea of grid interactive buildings um, I think is one of the keys to getting us to that is that we stop thinking of them as these individual units I had a colleague who made a comment I love that buildings are social creatures and we need to think of them as being social creatures and think of them in these networks and these larger communities and start thinking about how can we operate not just a building, but cities um, in these more dynamic ways. And that's our project um, is set up to be that. We have a, we've, um, have a very good relationship with Portland General Electric, which is the utility serving um, our part of downtown. Um, and they were very much collaborative with us and at the table as we worked through this project to try and get something. And the intent is to start using our building as a bit of a pilot project to start testing out some of these ideas of, of grid interactive buildings. All right, so that's kind of the, the real big stuff. So now I want to pull us into um, just talking about the energy use of the building itself um, and how we how we address that and how we met the um, living building pedals uh, requirement of being net positive energy. So living building requires that you're 105% net positive, which means that not only you're generating 100% of your building's usage, you're generating 105% of your building's usage on an annual um, basis. Slide. Um, so we are, um, you know, tracking on, on achieving that. Um, and I would say that there's, you know, the, the, the easiest electron is the one that you don't have to generate, right? So the first thing that we do in any high performance building is that you just really get that energy use down as, as far as you can go. Um, and doing it in a, you know, holistic way. I mean, there are definitely exceptions to that. When you think about embodied emissions, there's a, you know, we have actually a, a good case study on this, on our building itself, where we found that the energy efficiency from a third pane of glass had somewhat questionable payoffs when we thought about the fact that we were there was embodied emissions in that glass. So there's some kind of situations like that where you do want to be thinking about the holistic um, impact of your emissions decisions. But in general, the idea is you drive it down as low as you can, and then from there you use it as your target for your on-site renewables. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, and it's one thing that's, I think, so let's talk about kind of where our energy use is. So an EUI um, energy use intensity of 19.5 is is very low. It's achievable, particularly in office buildings. It is certainly achievable, but it is, um, you know, certainly considered a very high performance building. Um, but one of the things that I, I want to mention about this, this pie chart here is you'll notice that, um, you know, the biggest load we have is is plug loads. And that is different from what you'll see on most buildings. Most buildings, it's mechanical loads that come in the highest. And one of the reasons we were able to 
move them in both in their proportion in terms of and as well as their total magnitude is this idea of investing in the building instead of investing in the mechanical systems and so what that what that kind of means is starting to really look at how do you design a building in a way that you don't have to have a lot of um, active mechanical systems is that you have you know well insulated walls you have reasonable wall to window ratios you use passive um, you know, ventilation and um, heating and cooling um, approaches, or should be natural ventilation, heating, and then passive heating and cooling, and just really starting to use the building as part of your space conditioning system. And then only when you've really tapped out all that you can do there, then you layer on um, all, you know, the other mechanical systems. So this, for our project, we have radiant floors, which is a highly efficient system. Um, we do have the automated windows, that way we can do the passive heating and cooling as long as, as around um, natural ventilation as well. And then we've got heat recovery for um, the mechanical um, ventilation solutions on this. All right, so once we got those loads down, we then um, have PV that we have put on for our on-site renewables. Uh, one of the interesting things that we um, did for this one, and I guess Rachel maybe can do the next slide, is that one of the challenges we had is that because we are in the historic district in Portland, we could not have a visible um, kind of that more dramatic um, array, if you've ever seen um, for Bullet Center, uh, Candida, uh, the Candida project from Georgia Tech as well, where it's this very kind of prominent, very visible PV array. That wasn't an option here because of um, some of the appearance um, considerations for the historic district here in Portland. So we were limited truly to just the footprint of the building. And there was a lot of things that needed to be up there, right? We needed to have, um, you know, access aisles for code and and for um, for uh, fire protection reasons. We do have some mechanical systems up there. It's also where we do our rainwater collection, which is all the water for the building. So there was a lot of things that needed to get fit up there. So we needed to be very efficient and very um, strategic in how we use the space. And so what we ended up doing. Um, was that we actually have our panels oriented facing east and west. And so you kind of saw in that previous picture, it's sort of this like, uh, you know, these kind of east-west um, waves, which if you've ever taken, you know, PV 101, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're always supposed to point them south because um, it's the most efficient way to have them pointed. But what we ended up finding when we modeled it was that although we do take a little bit of an efficiency hit, by having it east-west, we were able to increase the number of panels on it. It's a much denser layout, as you can kind of see here, than we would have been able to do if they were all south because you had to have spacing so they don't shade each other. And so even though each panel is a teeny bit less efficient, overall, our production increased because we were able to fit more panels on. And so it ended up being a really creative solution that helped us get it closer to that goal of having our on-site production. The additional advantage is that um, it changes a little bit that profile of when we get our energy production. We get a little bit more evening, a little bit more morning, and it helps extend the number of hours each day where we're able to run off of the energy produced by our system. Okay, the last one I want to just touch on here is just, um, you know, Portland, like most of the major cities on the West Coast right now, um, we do have um, a social crisis that's underway um, regarding affordable housing. Um, you know, there's, we on any given night have um, 2,000 people who are sleeping on the street, another 2,000 who are sleeping in shelters, um, and then um, upwards of 12,000 who are in some other, other form of, of, you know, unsecure um, or unsafe housing. And so, this was on our mind, like I mentioned, you know, at the very beginning, living building does have a social equity um, element to one of the panels. And so we wanted to think about how we could probably achieve that at a local level as part of our project. Um, because of the space constraints on our roof, we were not able to get everything on our roof in terms of being net positive energy. And so we do qualify for an exception in the living building challenge to have part of our system um, located elsewhere. And so we decided to partner with a nearby affordable housing project that was just a, just a little bit north of our site, still in the same um, PGE, same utility region. So it's still very, very local. Um, and it was an affordable housing project that was in, in construction at that time. They had um, designed their systems to be PV ready, but they did not have the capital to install the system, actually install the system. And so what we ended up doing is donating the rest of our system to meet our net 
um, positive goals. We donated the panels to them and so that they could be installed on their building. So we get the, the renewable energy credits that we need. So kind of the paperwork that we need to meet our living building requirements, but they get the actual um, you know generated electrons, which offset their operating costs. And so it saves them about $20,000 a year in operating costs, which is money that can then just go directly back um, and to their programming. So um, yes, again, like I said, we believe that you know resiliency is part of the sustainable so story. We also believe that social equity and community building is part of the sustainability story. And we were um, really happy that we were able to kind of integrate both of those elements into our work on this project. And then I think we're going to finish it up uh, with water, water and nutrients. All right, thanks, Karina. Yeah, so uh, we'll talk about the water pedal nutrient cycle and how these manifest in the building's water systems. Okay, so let's start by following the water and the nutrients. This is a section of the building um, from left to left right, we have the lavatories and showers. These are our primary users of potable water. And then we have the almost waterless urinals and the, on the right, the vacuum flush toilets. So starting the journey with the potable water system, rainwater is captured on the roof and then it fills a 71,000 gallon cistern. The cistern is cast in place below the ground floor of the building. And then on a daily basis, water flows through the potable water treatment skid um, where it's monitored, filtered, sterilized with PV and chlorine and then pumped to a day tank and a booster pump station. From there, it flows to the fixtures and to our heat pump water heaters. Uh, so then when water is used, it sinks and showers, this water goes down the drain and heads to the gray water treatment system, where it's filtered, sterilized with UV, stored in a gray water tank, um, and from there is used for irrigation and flushing the vacuum toilets and occasionally the urinals. All right, so outlets from the urinals and toilets are a mixture of water and nutrients. This is traditionally considered a black water system. Um, here we call it a nutrient recovery system. The vacuum system pumps water and waste um, from the water closets to 20 compost bins for processing and eventual return to the soil. And then urine from the urinals flows to a nutrient recovery tank um, shown at the bottom there. Um, uh, where we'll uh, periodically we uh, use it to make fertilizer. So in essence, the building becomes a bit of a nutrient machine. We take water from the roof, we add in people and their nutrients, um, and then eventually we concentrate it to close the loop and return that back um, to the land. So go through a few photos here. This is of the rainwater cistern um, during construction. You can see the concrete sides there. It's about a 1600 square foot footprint. It's an L shaped under on the first floor of the building, under the first floor of the building, um, about six feet tall. This is a picture of that nutrient recovery tank as it's being lowered underground. Uh, it's got a baffle down the middle on the left is uh, for the urine and then on the right, um, it collects the leachate from the composters. All right, so this is um, uh, in our utility room. Um, most of this is water systems. Uh, you can see there is a hatch to the cistern and then we have the potable water treatment skid. There's a number of filters, different micron levels, uh, and then a UV, which is actually behind that control panel. Um, so it goes through the filters and then the UV sterilization. Uh, we, and then it's pumped out to the day tank. There's actually two day tanks. Um, one's just hidden there. Um, it's also, we do have additives that for B, the pH buffer and then um, chlorine, which is uh, required uh, by the city. Um, and then finally, our booster pump skid for pressurization and distribution through the building. On the right, you can see uh, a little bit, I guess, mainly the piping on the domestic hot water side, but just behind that are the two tank style um, heat pump water heaters. 
All right, um, so this is the other end of the utility room. These are the composters. Uh, there's 20 of them and the way the vacuum system works and then the, the pump system, it's got a manifold that then has valves to each composter so that sequentially they are dosed. That helps with water management um, and, and not having any one composter um, get too wet or too overloaded which was a, a actually a lesson learned from a previous uh, from the bullet center and previous living building projects here's a couple more pictures on the left there's the uh, uh, vacuum pumps and then second picture you can see the uh, on the floor there, there's the accumulator tank, so that's where it all ends up before then getting pumped to the various composters. And there is a, a routine maintenance associated with uh, turning turning the composters um, until they're they're ready to actually be be used as compost. All right, so a couple more photos. This is of the nutrient recovery system um, on the left. That's the distillation chamber. Um, and um, on the right, they're, they're working through um, one of the, the um, test runs. Uh, they've been doing it. I think it's, it's scheduled to happen about once a month where uh, urine from the nutrient recovery tank is taken and processed um, into fertilizer. The quick schematic of what that entails. Um, I don't know the, the too, too much specifics on it, but um, you can see uh, the various tanks and it goes through the distillation um, uh, process uh, to produce ammonium solution and then struvite powder, which I have a photo of here. So you can see the, the, pro the end product, the distillate and the struvite. Um, this is actually a, a company sort of in the making. We, we hope to be able to sell this as fertilizer. Okay, so then taking a step back on all of this, uh, what we did is um, uh, really reduced our, our water consumption in the first place. You can see on the right, just a comparison of code versus a typical low flow building, how much water use is happening um, typically. And with PAE Living Building, we really pushed that uh, the, the urinals are, like I said, almost waterless. Um, they flush every couple of days just to make sure there's no crystals formed, kind of flush out the system. And then uh, the water closets use about a pint of water. Um, so very minimal water use and then uh, we have a hundred percent reduction of municipal water use since we are collecting that water on the roof and then we have the recycling systems with the gray water so really what we're trying to do here is uh, fix a, a broken cycle um, in today's modern age, we have a very linear uh, process for uh, growing plants and food and then uh, managing our waste. Um, and that on the bottom, you can see what, what we're trying to do here is really close that loop and have, have what you eat then become the, the fertilizer for, for the plants to grow. All right, and with that, I think that that um, concludes what, what we've got uh, prepared for you. So we wanted to open it up uh, for questions. Any takers? And silence. <laughs> uh, for, for, for the, uh, the water system, but what happens if it doesn't rain for two or three months? Yeah, so uh, the, the cistern, the so 71,000 gallon tank, it is sized for on an annual basis. So we looked at our water use annually and our water <laughs> consumption and modeled it so that we have, you know, a, a full tank coming out of the rainy season can get us all the way through the dry season. Um, so it's in that sense, it's, it's not, it's a, a bit oversized, I guess, as your battery um, to handle those dry months. We also have a, a potable water backup if we ever need um, to use the, the municipal water system. 
but the intention is, you know, li Living Building Challenge is a performance-based uh, um, certification, and so we have to demonstrate that we really are net positive energy and that we aren't, uh, we're not uh, discharging waste to the sewer system or using water from the municipal site. All right, thank you. Hi, Rachel and Karina, great presentation. Thank you. And good to see a fellow OIT hustling owl, hey, Rachel. Hi. hi. Um, I have so many questions, but uh, just on the waste system, out of curiosity, how do you manage the end products? Is that and you said eventually you want to try to turn it into a business, but do you have, is there a company that services those for you and takes the products out so, to farms? Yeah, so I mean, it's all still kind of in the works. We're in the tuning process right now. Um, so uh, this for the uh, urine um, turn into a fer fertilizer, that is becoming a company. This is Biohabitats. Uh, uh, as and Pete Munoz with Biohabitats is leading that effort. Um, so working to find a market. Um, right now it's pretty small, right? Like we're the the building is getting occupied and and filling up. So we don't have it's not like we have a ton of product at this point. Um, so um, this is a great proof of concept and trying to get pave the way to actually get um, it, it on the market. Um, so that's on the urine side. On the compost side, you do have to get someone to come and take it um, and and put it out on the land. Uh, it wouldn't be used on uh, uh, agriculture farmland, um, but still can be used as a um, as a soil amendment. So I don't know who's handling that. Um, I mean, we do have a facilities uh, team um, that, that helps uh, with the, the routine ma maintenance of the composters and all that. And did and you guys look, did you do any financial analysis to see if the cost of the system, uh, you know, how long it would take to, to get, get it paid for? On the urine, the nutrient recovery? On, yeah, on both, on, on it as a whole. I am not sure. I mean, I know it, it's, I think there's sort of fluctuating prices as far as what we think we'll get for it. Karina, do you know? If there's... Yeah, I mean, there's kind of two pieces to it. One is 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 the nutrient recovery we do think could be a revenue generator of potentially up to like, you know, $50,000 a year is I think what I've heard on it. But again, it's we're still ramping that up and, and figuring out the market for it, which quite honestly, the market might change. I mean, there's quite a bit of discussion right now, which is some of the global um, geopolitical situations that are affecting fertilizer surprise. So it may be <laughs> all of a sudden worth a whole yeah. lot uh, more um, soon. Um, the I will say that the compressor systems, particularly the like the blue, all the blue bins you saw, it is a lot, right? And it when we, you know, when you look at our room and hopefully I do, I really, I, let's get a tour set up and we'll walk you through and we can talk about the system in a lot more detail. Um, it is quite impressive to see what it looks like to have a water and waste treatment plant in your building, right? And I think for us is that it's not necessarily that we're advocating that every building should do this alone. Um, it's for us, it's more pushing on this idea of rethinking how we, how we treat water and how we just even in the languaging waste, right? We call it waste. And in reality, it's a resource, right? It's this precious, precious resource of nutrients. And it's trying to reframe that conversation. I don't know that a single building is actually the right scale for it. It is, it is expensive and it is high maintenance, but it also feels like that our current system is probably not the right scale either. And so it kind of pushes on this question and, and tries to show what's possible by showing that you can do it, right? We can do nutrient um, reclamation. We can do composting in a, you know, downtown, you know, urban commercial building. It is possible. And it's, I would say that when you work on these projects, one of the things that for me, is so important about living buildings and projects like this is that it shifts the conversation of the question of well can you do it to let's talk about how we can do it and so part of what this system shows is it answers that question can you do it yes you can do it so let's not debate that anymore let's instead start talking about how can we do it how can we do this better how can we do this at scale um, and it just really kind of reframes what those conversations are about 
Yeah, thank you. And then maybe while other people are chatting, can you just pull up the HVAC um, slide one more time? Yes. Thank you. Let's see. Is your waste recovery uh, system, is that incorporated into your life cycle cost where you showed that the um, uh, net zero building is competitive with conventional construction? Is was that factored in there too? That, not uh, any not any expenses? revenues from it but that is a good point that the cost of the system is like that is part of our performa had to work with the cost and it is i mean the the plumbing system on this was an expensive element um but the performa works with that system right so we have an on-site power plant we have an on-site water treatment plant an on-site waste treatment plant and all of that was possible within that successful performa right with certified right. operators um, for the the water side, and I take just to, to Karina's point, it, it it costs money and it also takes up space. So we have a, a a rather large mechanical room, but in the reality, the mechanical equipment is pretty minimal and and fits in like one little corner, whereas the majority of it is is really water side systems um, and electrical. What, what do you see as the demand for this kind of construction? Are you by having people just beat down your doors saying, I want a building like this? Or are you having uh, um, to really market hard to develop interest in it? And what is the level of interest right now? And, and uh, so it's fascinating to me. And I think that there should be a tremendous market for it. But uh, what's your experience in that? I mean, we're, we're fairly busy. Um, so that's good, um, but we would love to see more of it. I mean, I think, so again, you know, we we have been very lucky to, to work with wonderful clients around the country on high performance building with um, really, you know, forward looking goals. And I, this is certainly elements of this, We but we would love to see more living buildings specifically. And, and again, that was part of why we wanted to do the project the way that we did and have it be developer led. Um, because it sort of did a little bit of that myth busting on terms of the financial aspect of it. And so we very much hope that by getting um, not just the technical story out there, but the financial and that kind of economic story out there, um, that we will start to see this done at scale instead of just being kind of these, um, you know, single successful projects. We want to see whole cities that are, are like that. So, um, yeah, you know, we got to got to get the word out there that it, it can be done and um, that we, you know, this, this can be done and it can be done in a way that's economically responsible as well. It's pushing one o'clock and I see there's a couple of chat questions of uh, clean yeah, race. Can you see those? Uh, oh, I yes. Let me not. see. I can pull them up. Do you have someone with their hand up as well? Mark, Mark. I, I have a quick question while you're looking at that. So I, actually two. So you talk about it working out in the pro forma. Is that based on it, it being a class A office building or or what uh, what is that measured against? Yeah, so it is. So it's it's uh, office building. I'm trying to think if we did mixed use at all. I don't think we did. I think it's predominantly at this point is all class A office um, on each floor or if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, I can't think of anything we did that was mixed use. So yeah, it's a class A office. Okay, so I, I'd be curious and, and I would very much like to come take a tour, um, but I'd be curious to know what that translates to when you start thinking about public buildings where um, you're not necessarily creating a pro forma because it's not ever meant to produce profits. It's simply how much does that cost relative to what it's doing. Um, so that's that's one piece and we could do that when when I come take the tour. But I have another question. Uh, I was fascinated that you talked about you couldn't do your array like you had done on the bullet building because of Portland's historic uh, designate or yeah, historic designation on the downtown. Um, how much of a difference in the array, do you think that made what like a percentage or a? Yeah, so I mean, our to the size of the array that we we needed to achieve that 
105%, which is actually, um, we're engineers, so we we always have a little bit of a buffer. So it's more like 110, 120 percent, or 115, because you want to make sure you've got give yourself some some grace. Um, but to the array, our total array size between the two sites, between our building and then um, the affordable housing project, it's about 40 percent of the array lives on our building, and about 60 percent lives on the other building. So it would have been a fairly significant um, overhang to it. Um, which is, I mean, is the case in in for most buildings in terms of the the roof. It, at least when you're doing the multi-story ones, I mean, it's fairly easy to do it in a single or two-story. Um, once you hit about four, and certainly by five, and we we are a five-story building, is where you really start to get an a top hat that's much larger than the building's footprint. Um, and so I, that's part of also why we wanted to tell kind of the story of why we chose to go the way that we did um, instead of trying to push on on the local codes around it is that what we ran into as a challenge is going to be a challenge for most five story or higher buildings. And so thinking creatively about how it can maybe be at a community scale instead of a local scale, um, we think is something that would maybe open the door to net zero net positive um, kind of approaches to, to more buildings. We also, oh, oh, go ahead. Well, as, just to add on to that, um, you know, you, you notice in the mechanical system, you know, we're using rooftop uh, uh, heat pumps, you know, air source heat pumps. We didn't do a geothermal uh, system, which would have been really costly. Um, so in, tor in terms of having this being a developer led building um, and having it take pay back, we have very efficient systems, but not the extreme efficient possible, right, to keep it economic. Um, we also, as Karina mentioned on the plug loads, you know, there, are, you know, we reduce all the other loads and there's still this big, big pie of, of, of plugs and server loads. And, and even though that's showing high, we did a lot of work in trying to reduce those being really efficient in how we designed um, uh, uh, even, even, you know, the, the networking side of things. And, um, but while still allowing flexibility because these are gonna be leased spaces and not putting so many constraints on, on the, the tenants. Great. Thank you. Is, uh, is there an email address or something I would use to, to schedule a tour? It would be Katrina's. Yeah, you know what, what, Rachel, maybe just put back to the, put the last slide up there. Yours and mine's mm -hmm. addresses are on that. Um, and I can put it in the chat as well. I'll put mine into the chat and feel free to just reach out to me and then I can connect you um, with uh, Katrina in our office who schedules all the arranged stall or tour arrangements. Cool, thank you. Um, and I guess I can quickly, some of the ones in the chat here, um, correct, we do not have hydroponics or aquaponics on the project. We do have um, a little urban ag area though. Um, in our, our, our fifth floor, we have what we call a decany, which is um, windows that are actually the entire walls open up entirely. Um, and so our renew team um, that Rachel helps lead, which is kind of like our, our in-house green team um, has a bunch of, um, uh, planter boxes up there and so we've got um, some lettuce that is just going going great right now you can just get your lunch by going out and trimming out some stuff and a bunch of herbs and strawberries are doing really well and yeah so we do have a little bit of urban ag going but not hydroponics mm -hmm. might I say that uh, there's a couple more questions there I wonder if we might uh, uh, I had a, a couple of announcements one is uh, a question uh, for Rachel and Karina. Uh, we like, if possible, to have the power, make the PowerPoint available and the uh, recording available uh, to other members. Uh, is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. And we can um, send a, a PDF version of the the slides um, to We'd share. We'd appreciate well. that. We'd appreciate that. And and then uh, also. Uh, uh, oh, if anyone wants to get a professional development hour uh, credit, please uh, send an email to Mike Unger at Comcast.net. And uh, with with that, uh, uh, if people want to stay around for a couple more questions, uh, please feel please feel free to do that. I know you have a couple of chat questions there. I 
to go through some of the ones. Um, thanks. The, yeah, somebody put in about the the um, fertilizer. I, you know, I'm not sure. We can certainly pass on um, the idea over to to Pete Munez. I, I, I'll be honest. I don't. He's kind of running with that one for us. He's with Biohabitats. Um, but it's a good, yeah, it's a good question. We we think that there's, we know that there's a market for it. There's even been discussion of could we just give it away to to employees because we got a lot of a lot of home gardeners. Um, there's another one here about would it be possible to retrofit buildings to be um, I'm assuming it's net zero or or uh, maybe net positive. Um, that to be honest is one of the biggest nuts that needs to be cracked in the industry. Um, you know, even though we the industry is continuing to build new buildings all the time, and we certainly feel that all of them should be living buildings. There's no reason yeah. to to build anything else at this point, but um, really, if we're going to meet the decarbonization goals that we need to meet as a kind of larger society and the timeline that we need to meet them, um, really figuring out how to crack the nut on the the existing buildings. How do we bring that existing building stock up? Um, Rachel and I actually have a project right now that we're working on, which is a hundred year old, a very large hundred year old building. And part of what we're looking at is how do we, how do we decarbonize it? And it's, you know, looking at that kind of with that lens at any time there's any sort of major retrofit um there's some key items that can be done of you know moving towards electrification so just getting fossil fuels off, out of buildings entirely um and then looking for opportunities to improve efficiencies with you know envelope upgrades and windows and that sort of stuff and then moving into these more efficient mechanical um systems but yeah it's a it's the, the challenge of our lives to get that one figured out oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, Rachel and Karina, thank you very much for, for a great presentation. I, I know I learned a lot. And, uh, I can tell from the that questions. Was awesome, Harry. Yes, uh, I'd like to learn more about that. And uh, John Shaw, did you have a question? No, I just put in the comments about Milorganite. I worked on a project there some years back, uh, the Milwaukee uh, Sewage Treatment Plant at Jones Island. And that's where they produce the organite. They've been doing that for a number of years. So it might be a possibility of uh, research for the, the waste product. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, All thank right. you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, great, great presentation. And uh, we'll be talking more. Yes, thank you so much. Look, and we'll look forward look to doing forward a tour to soon. Setting up a yeah. Yeah, look forward <laughs> exactly. to that. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending thank a bit of time Karina. with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Bye now.